Hello and welcome to Geek Warning, the podcast that puts the world's most interesting cycling tech into one place. I'm Dave Rome, and joining me this week, we've got a regular and then we've got a new voice. First, the regular, Brad Copeland. How are you doing? Hello, Dave. Uh, I'm doing wonderfully, as always. Great. Always happy to hear it. Uh, and the new voice is uh, one of our newest tech hires to Escape Collective, uh, Suvi Lopinen. Suvi, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Suvi, uh, I think for people that listen to Spin Cycle, they might have heard your voice already. But for anyone that uh, just listens to Geek Warning, uh, they might have seen your byline appear on the site. But uh, tell us, where did you come from? So, yeah, I'm relatively new to the cycling media. I was at Road to Sea before I joined Escape ranks. I've been in the bike industry, though, for a bit longer in bike shops. And before getting into the media side of things, I was at working at a bike share, for example. So, oh, yeah. Interesting. What were you doing there? I was a business development manager, but I'd say okay. I was doing everything. I mean, I was okay. building the bikes, retrieving them yeah. from the rivers, pretty much. <laughs> Whatever oh, wow. goes okay. on in bike shares, you know, everything. Yeah, yeah. Typical uh, bike industry role where you you do ten things. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I guess, yeah, what got you started in writing about cycling or, or cycling tech to be specific? Like what, what was it that inspired you to take that path? I think that's probably since I started cycling, I've always wanted to know how to fix my own bikes and just know about the tech rather than just ride bikes. And I guess I've always been more interested in that maybe than even racing side of things. Yeah. I didn't grow yeah. up racing bikes. So yeah, then working in bike shops just kind of got more into knowing about different bikes and then just from there I realized I could combine that with my journalism degree and background so it all kind of worked out well and I became a tech writer. I think you're in good company there as far as uh, perhaps uh, liking the tech as much as the writing of the things. Yeah. So it's um, yeah uh, that's kind of what we are uh, on this podcast uh in a sense we love riding bikes but we also love the bikes so um yeah i mean what are your riding preferences like what what kind of bikes do you prefer to ride and what bikes are you riding currently i mean i've got a test bike which is obviously <laughs> yeah i ride a lot of test bikes i feel i barely get to ride my own bikes anymore <laughs> In the last mm -hmm. last couple of years, but my own road bike is a Tarmac SL6, which is probably the bike that I've owned the longest. Feels silly to yeah. say because it's not that old of a bike, but it is the one that I've clocked the most miles on. But I'd say since I've got that bike, I've totally steered more to the gravel side of things. That's probably my preferred discipline if I could only choose one, but long distance road bikes as well. I love them. Yeah, okay. Drop by world. Is your SL6 rim brake or disc brake? Disc brake. Disc brake. Okay. All right. A good generation of bike that. So. It is, and it's, it's a nice one because no one knows whether it's a rim or disc when you say it. I think Ronan still has his rim brake SL6. So, uh, yeah, there's there's a few in the Escape, uh, amongst the Escape Collective team. Yeah. So I believe Alex, uh, actually, who's the other new tech writer who joined yes. alongside me. Um, yeah, I think he might have had one as well. So, I don't know. Interesting. Yeah, I, I, I had one uh, for about nine months. So I can't say I owned it, but uh, I had it on long-term loan. And uh, yeah, it was sad to give that one back. Good bike. I also uh, had an anyway. SL6 rim brake. Did you? Yeah, just want to throw brake. my hat in the ring. Yeah, I did. All right. We've all had SL6s in some capacity. The, the tie that binds. Yes. Great bike, though. Seriously. It's a classic at this point. So uh, it's not even that old. Uh, and Sophie, where's that accent from? Oh, the accent. <laughs> um, I'm originally from Finland, so I guess I have a little bit of a Finnish rally accent still left in me. But I have lived in Scotland for a bit, so quite a few years okay. now. So I guess it's a, it's a mix of those two. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you being in Scotland, uh, we are on almost opposite time zones at the moment. Uh, so it's pretty late there for you. So you'll join us for, uh, I guess cover some news and uh and then you might uh jump off to go to bed and uh and brad and i will continue after that but uh so yeah i mean with that let's let's not get it, let it get too late for you uh 
Before we get started, I just want to remind everyone that Escape Collective is fully member-funded. We don't have any ads. We don't have any uh, affiliate link content. We don't have any sponsored content. So this podcast that you're hearing is wholly and solely funded by our members. So thank you if you are a member. And if you're not a member, please consider becoming a member with Escape Collective. You can head to escapecollective.com forward slash member, sign up support what we do and gain yourself access to everything that we do. Uh, we're now publishing, I think even on a weekly basis, uh, member exclusive podcasts in addition to this one that you're hearing. So there's plenty of content that uh, only our members are getting in full. So enjoy it. Uh, all right. With that, uh, let's jump in to a little bit of news. So uh, Suvi, uh, you were following along this weekend. Uh, we, there was a, a small race, Gravel World Cycling Championships few big names took part. A few big names won the thing. Uh, we had Voss take the women's and Matthew Vanderpoel take the men's. But from a tech point of view, it's it's pretty interesting. And and I guess, yeah, how different the, the UCI races for gravel uh, are as versus what we see out of the US gravel scene and, and how that drives bike decisions. What were some broad themes that you saw? I think the broadest theme was that last year there were people still on road bikes as well, riding the gravel world mm. champs. But I think this year it was predominantly gravel bikes. So even Matthew okay. Van der Poel had a gravel bike to ride. But then still they were riding, most of the pros were riding pretty narrow tires, pretty high pressures, obviously because of that. I mean, the course was hardly the roughest the most technical course. I think it was more of an ur- urban technical course with all the obstacles uh-huh. on the pavements. <laughs> and yeah, road gearing, road road pedals. It was more like a, like a Belgian classics race rather than a gravel race, I think, tech side of things. Yeah. So, I mean, like we, we recently had Dylan Johnson on the Performance Process podcast. And in that, he was talking about like, you know, for American gravel races that he's often now looking to run the biggest tire he can you know, like a basically a mountain bike tire on the gravel bike. And he and his testing shown that that's fastest. And we've seen the likes of uh, Keegan Swenson as well take to that sort of approach. But by contrast, I mean, yeah, this race, as you said, like pretty narrow tires. Like we're talking like 32, 35s. I think the winners were, uh, at least Vanderpol was on 38s, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite a big difference. Uh, you mentioned higher pressures. How high are we talking? I think at least what I heard and seen, it's been like 50, even 60 for some, but I guess wow. it depends. If you're going That's for 32, I guess you, yeah. you could, if you're, I don't know, a bigger rider. Yeah, maybe. But then this was only the pros really, because obviously the groups of riders, there were so many riders out there. And I mean, it seemed like mm-hmm. a bit of a carnage at times, especially in the beginning when they were all starting at the same time and finishing at the same time, the different age groups and, and the elite people. Yeah, quite a few crashes out of uh, desperation by the sounds of it. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it was necessarily Man. like who was fastest. It was the luckiest who managed to squeeze through the tightest spots <laughs> at the right yeah. time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, some other interesting things on the bikes that we're seeing is like a lot of road gearing on these bikes. Like there's not a whole lot of like uh, towards the pointy end, like... Yeah, they basically look like road bikes from afar is how they've been set up. Did you did you see any massive chain rings in use? Not any massive ones. I think it was pretty much the same gearing as they would have taken for road. 52, 36 was pretty common. I think more SRAM okay. riders, yeah, I guess for obvious reasons, were riding one bikes as well. Um, yeah. And yeah, but it was it was kind of road, road gearing rather than gravel. And it wasn't very hilly, okay. so makes sense. Brad, did you see anything uh, as far as trends in in the gravel that sort of stood out to you? Well, Dave, it reminds me of our ongoing debate about what is gravel anyway. And this yeah. really, really this was, was an all this road was an race. all road world championships, is what it was. And yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, everything that uh, Suvi mentioned was kind of. Uh, what I was picking up on too, that these were essentially just slightly beefed up. I'm almost like how a road bike would be set up at Roubaix, you know, even down to tire widths these days where they're 32 ish, uh, even on the road bikes. So, you know, that's kind of been the debate between American gravel and international gravel anyway, for the last number of years where we've seen this kind of thing before. And, uh, you know, what constitutes gravel is a bit of a heated discussion yeah. in the gravel in the gravel realm so a number of the top americans didn't even go some of that had to do with some controversy from the federation not really funding it 
which is a whole other topic, uh, but perhaps too because the American gravel specialist might specialize in a different texture of gravel than the gravel at World Championships this year. Maybe that was not the race for them in the first place. Although Keegan Swenson, um, who's kind of the preeminent talent in the United States these days, uh, has done quite well at races like that. He even went to um, down to Australia, Dave, to uh, participate in the Road World Championships a few years back. So mm-hmm. he did. Yeah, yeah. He did. So he's a last minute selection. Yes, yes, and. Uh, he was, I believe, was he was fourth last year at Gravel Worlds too, or fourth or fifth, yeah, 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 something yeah. like that. I mean, an incredibly good result, especially given the Palmares of his uh, podium mates. So, uh, yeah, but nevertheless, a curious kind of departure from the trends that we typically point to these days, Dave, in uh, our recent podcast episodes about where gravel's headed and what it takes to be mm-hmm. a relevant gravel bike these days. Uh, pretty much none of those things were seen on the race bikes at Worlds no. this year. So uh, what no. do we know? But um, it's uh, always it's always cool to see how the bikes are set up for a one-day specific yeah. event. And uh, I think Marianne Voss's curious tire pressure yeah. sy- system is my favorite piece of tech. It's a bit of a controversy, though, in the comments. Some people really hate it. I don't know. Let's discuss it. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's a bit of tech that uh, our own Ronan McLaughlin has been following for a number of years at this point. I mean, we've sort of seen it come in in use at, like, Paru Bay, for example, but it's never really, yeah, I mean, taken off until now. They've officially launched it for sale. It's the the Grava. And uh, so, Viam, how would you pronounce that? I don't know. I would say Grava, yeah. but I, I think I've heard Grava. A lot as well, so I yeah. yeah. I've I've I, I often butcher these names, so Graval. Uh, it's good to get a second. Graval. I don't know. Yeah, so there's a lot of vowels in this. Uh, but yeah, basically it's a a tire inflating system that's built a little compressor that's basically built into the hub and and can be used to uh yeah add air, so you can deflate the air and then add it back depending on the the sectors. It's incredible. Brad, you seem to love it. Uh, I don't know a lot about it. Um, I mean, who can tell me something about it? Brad, well, why do you love it? Yeah, you love it too, Suvi? I don't know you if I know. love it. Yeah. I think it seems a bit of a faff as well. It's a lot of faff, but I kind of love- It's a heavy expense Yeah, for it's, me. It's, um, but, you know, it also points, Dave, to um, uh, the nuanced importance and science of tire pressure if you really want to mm-hmm. to parse it and in a race where you're sometimes on gravel and sometimes on- pavement which they were um you know that's kind of two different setups and pressures that you would you know if you had two bikes and you were going for a ride on one or the other surface you definitely would run different pressures and um never has it been possible to actually do that until now and like the technology in the little hub i mean it's quite amazing that it's Mm. even capable of what it's doing to me but yeah they say that over the course of like a kilometer you can add up to one bar of pressure uh, however, they judge that a, a kilometer in distance, it's kind of like it charges the compressor off rotate, rotation in the hub. I won't pretend to understand the nuance of that uh, contraption, but that's basically what, what it's doing. And it feeds, obviously, air through a hose that kind of enters a special valve of theirs. And you can control it with buttons on the handlebar, like a little blip or a, kind of like a satellite shifter type button under the bar tape. And so, you know, you can anticipate where you want to add pressure. It takes a while for it to happen, but you can drop pressures quickly. I think it's like a half bar in like a, like a couple seconds or a second or something like that because it can just release the air all out. Yeah, and then and then reinflate. Uh, I mean, so you've you've written down here like fourteen psi per kilometer with a yeah one bar per kilometer. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. Um, it's not a lot, but it's also kind of I mean, no, I think it is. but but it's a lot. And like if you set the pressure correctly and you know where your you know your targets are, and it it actually sends uh, the data to your head unit or phone. So it, it tells you what pressure you're at. It's not like a guessing game or a feeling game. It's quite a sophisticated little object and I'm kind of fascinated by it. For me, I think the biggest kind of what what makes me wonder if this is really usable, especially in race scenarios, like you st- do need to press the button. I'm not sure whether you need to push it continuously or whether you just blip it or like, what do you do to it? But I, I would imagine that if you're in a race, do, do you have really time to look at your computer? Mm-hmm. Like, oh, now it's up one one PSI, now it's up two PSI, like keep pressing this button. It feels like a lot. Because they gave this example that over a 200 mile gravel course, a 72 kilo rider could see, a, okay, that they would get a benefit, what's it benefit? Finish 28 minutes faster, having carried out an estimated 80 to 100 tire pressure changes en route. That is a lot, a lot of changes. Like... I'd be happy yeah. pumping out the tires in the beginning, maybe once in the course, but like it, 
Yeah, it's yeah. a lot of changes. I, 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 I struggle to remember when to eat correctly, let alone uh, when to inflate and deflate my tires for various sectors. I would argue, though, that it's sort of like the replacement for doing the same thing with a dropper seat post in a long-distance mountain bike race, where you're doing the yeah. same the same number of activations of the posts. I mean, you're not obviously pushing and holding it. If you're pushing and holding it and like looking at your screen and waiting for that, you know, the desired PSI to appear, that's a little bit more of like a focused activity than in just raising or sitting down on your on your saddle to uh, drop the post. So, but it's kind of the same thing for the same reason. You know, it's like a definite you get more control you get more speed in certain scenarios where if it's only just the push of a button it's kind of you know it's only yeah. it's only going to get better from here the fact that the technology exists to me is 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 kind of it's fascinating that it's that it exists in my opinion i think the the future usage for this technology would involve gps because i mean mm-hmm. all the riders already have head units on their bikes so, i mean mm-hmm. they've already got the the course uploaded in front of them uh, and I think the future implementation of this would be to somehow automate the inflation and deflations based on GPS location so they could preset where it does activate. Uh, and at that point, if it's automatic, uh, I think it starts to make a lot more sense. You just at that point sort of have the argument over like, you know, the 450 grams it adds to the bike or yeah, I mean, other other factors like I don't know what it's taking away from your rolling resistance in the hub. It, it's probably pretty marginal, but it would be something. And yeah, I mean, there's there's probably other trade-offs, maybe a small thing in aerodynamics. But yeah, I, I think the benefits here are also pretty enormous. So it, it's probably outweighing those losses pretty significantly. So it's exciting. It's also very expensive. I mean, how much yeah. are we looking at here? Yeah, it was um, because there's two wheel sets available, right? So there's a reserve one and a DT Swiss. And reserve ones are cheaper, £3,200 roughly. 3,900 okay. euros. Gotcha. So okay. that's quite a lot, like four grand, essentially. The DT Swiss ones yeah. are even more. So that's like 4,400 yeah. euros, roughly. Yeah, yeah. wow. Well, yeah. yeah. So it, it's it's yeah, not okay. for everyone, definitely. No. But, but you know, there are normal wheel sets that cost more than that, you know? They so are. So it's, you know. I think you're going back to, didn't you not talk last week about the oversized pulley wheels and then eventually you got to the fire <laughs> Yeah, but yeah. at least at least this does does something for the money, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This um, is this is more expensive than the a twentieth anniversary set of ceramic speed pulley wheels. But uh, dare I say, uh, ceramic speed pulley wheels aren't able to claim a uh, twenty eight minute time saving over two hundred miles. <laughs> they sure would. They would like to. Yes. Dave, uh, by the way, I uh, I just to your point of uh, it does have some some drag in the system, so to speak, when uh, when it's kind of activating it's like a clutch type contact that activates its little mini compressor it's a two to five watt equivalent of friction that is active only when the system is charging so when you're Mm -hmm. inflating it basically yeah um they claim there's no friction at all when you're not no added friction so two to five watts but then when you consider that they give you a 20 watt normalized power benefit claimed over mm. you know a long race a 200 mile gravel course they is their metric then the good outweighs the bad it's easy math everyone should buy this it makes perfect sense i guess no especially debate. if you have punctures i would say that's that's the biggest like if you think on a long race like that's where you can you can really lose it if you lose a your yeah. spot in a group um because of a puncture and i could see that this would be very useful there because you can just keep rolling when yes. you can just keep pushing the pressure in. Yeah, assuming and especially assuming your sealant is doing a half decent job to seal it, it's sort of yeah, you could be re-equalizing your your wanted pressures all the time and you know any losses could be negated by this. So, yeah, it's certainly interesting tech. I mean, Brad, you sound like an absolute fan. Suvi, you sound somewhat skeptical as, as I, I think where my head is on this, but uh yeah, I think it's it's one to watch and uh, it's something we have been watching and yeah, Grava is is the brand and I guess Grava. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think it, it's one you'll probably hear for us talk about again in future and especially given rumors of a mountain bike version and all sorts of things. So yeah, hopefully something we can get our hands on for review and in the near future. But uh, also new and also seen at the the Gravel World Cycling Championships. Those two new bikes. I mean, Suvi, you... you pointed this one out to me um lapia had a, a new bike which actually seemingly got launched at the event uh, and is now official what is it so it's a new cross hill carbon fiber bike okay so first ever i believe and that is what has been said 
um, carbon fiber bike, carbon fiber gravel bike for a lap year because the old cross okay. hill, whenever it came out, I feel years and years ago, it was only mm. aluminum. So this is now gotcha. a carbon fiber okay. bike and the one is specifically at the gravel world champs. And it was also at the Dutch national gravel championships, I think, ridden by the same rider, Amber Krug. Um, yeah, it's it's quite a squishy bike compared to what some of the roadies, other roadies were riding because <laughs> it has a dropper post, yeah. it has a yeah suspension fork and yeah, a very mountain bike inspired frame. So it's kind of at first glance when it was before it was released, it did look a lot like the Pro Race CF from Lapeer. Mm -hmm. I think it, I mean, it looks almost identical. I feel the frame, except that it has a little bit more mount for top to bag and whatnot. But yeah, a very yeah. interesting looking bike and a yeah, whole new carbon fiber range. So that one that was at the Gravel Worlds, that was the range topper model, but okay. there's there's a bit more affordable models as well. So yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, I mean, the, the key uh, defining frame feature here other than the suspension fork is like, yeah, the seat stays sort of bypass the seat tube and they sort of then connect onto the, onto the top tube, which is sort of a... a designed to be a comfort inducing feature and it's something lapier have done with a a few of their road bikes in the past and it's uh going further back there was actually uh there was like a a company called Velagi, which uh i think were sort of first to do this in carbon fiber they were a, a disc brake exclusive brand back before disc brakes on road bikes were really a thing uh so yeah it's it's sort of a proven design idea at this point and you can go further back in cycling history to see similar but uh yeah, it's, it's an interesting looking bike. It's a little odd though. I was looking at the geometry chart on this one and I have to say um, I'm a little confused by it. It's, uh, yeah, you look at it and it looks like a really progressive like off-road focused gravel bike with that suspension fork on the front. But then uh, the geometry, like at least in my size, is going to have toe overlap with it. Yeah, the, the reach figures are very road-like but with a very high stack. Um yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. Just based on that geometry, on those geometry figures, I'm not sure if this is uh, as off-roady as it may it may uh, visually look. Yeah, it also does have only clearance for 45 mil, which you'd right. Okay. Imagine that, that a bike that looks like it does with the suspend the suspension models, especially the suspension fork models. You'd assume that yep. you'd, it, it's kind of and it's, it is geared towards racing and adventure riding. So it's it's not just a race bike, but still 45 mil, mil clearance, which is enough mm -hmm. for world champs, but not for Dylan Johnson. So yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah. it is, I guess, debatable whether it's enough or not. Yeah, it's a suspended all-road bike, I think Brad would. It's a new, a new subcategory of all-road. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, so that's that new bike from Lapier. There's also a new bike from uh, Superior, which is a, a Czech bike manufacturer, a Czech bike brand. And yeah, I mean, Superior might be a new brand for a lot of people listening. Uh, Sylvia, I'll, I'll let you introduce the brand. I don't know. Have you heard about them, Brad? You know, it's a, that's a good question. Uh, had I not spent a lot of the last year, a uh, few years in Europe um, on the cross-country World Cup scene, I would have never heard of Superior. Uh, yeah. They do not exist in the United States, to my knowledge. They're not imported here or I sold here. Maybe think, they are. Maybe they are now. I, I don't think know. Uh, maybe they are because I know Bikes Online, which is an Australian business that also has an entity in the US, Okay, uh, just picked them up and launched them this year in Australia. And I, I would have thought they'd be launching them in the US too. They may, they may have. I, maybe it's just for Australia. Corrections Corner incoming, but uh, I, I mean, <laughs> you don't see him much either way in the no. United States, if ever. So um, only because of uh, some unique circumstances have I actually heard of Superior. I think it is yeah. definitely a brand more known for yeah mountain biking scene, and because they are sponsoring a UCI team now as well, or yes. since well, it last since last year. But yeah, they've been making bikes since 2016, so they've been around for a long while. And but yeah, mainly a European brand. They did seem to have some sorts of distribution in the US as well. I saw little dots on the map, so who knows? Maybe you'll spot them soon, Brad. Okay. I'll keep my eyes peeled, but I'm not seeing them. Yeah. But they do have all. They have mountain bikes, road bikes, and their new Superior XRGR 9.9. Here's the bike that was <laughs> launched at the Growl World Champs. It's a bit of a limited edition bike, but a pretty interesting looking bike. I quite like the the color scheme of it. It's kind of like a very burgundy red 
bike, but it's obviously what it claims to be is the fastest, lightest, most aero gravel bike ever made. Mm. But it is pretty wow. light as a carbon fiber frame, 200 800 they must, they must be the first one to make that claim oh yeah absolutely maybe they should call themselves superlative rather than superior but uh yeah that's everybody's <laughs> claim isn't it each week we have a new fastest lightest uh Indeed. arrowist yeah. yeah yeah pretty much there's yeah there's there's some things that are interesting about the frame itself yeah yeah 827 gram i think that was size yeah, medium light. frame so it's pretty light yep. um yeah, but other than that, it's the pretty standard aero-shaped tubes. Drop steep, steep stays, it has UDH, 45mm tire clearance, integrated mm. tail light. Yeah, it's 45 maybe. again. Yeah, it's a 45 yeah. again. But this is, I think, yeah. interesting conversation as well, that whether you could fit in more than that, you could probably clear yeah, more than Yeah, you typically can, yeah. But that so is the recommended uh so superior like at least in australia like they kind of they've launched into the country as being like a really high value oriented brand like very high performance but also with a lot of value uh i don't know if that's just exclusive to how they're being sold consumer direct in australia or whether that applies to other markets uh yeah i gotta say i'm a, a little bit naive on this on this brand i don't know a lot about how they how they're sold and how they're placed within the European market. But they have been linked with a former Olympic champion and former world champion, Yaroslav Kohavi, for a few years now. So, uh, and I think he was representing them at the Gravel World Champs. So, yeah, I mean, certainly a, a big name in that in that part of the world. And, you know, he's sort of the uh, you know, the mountain bike hero of, of, uh, of that country. So, uh, certainly some firepower to the brand there. But um, a brand to watch from what I've seen. Like, yeah, they, they really are packing the value in locally and they're offering a bike that looks like, you know, a lot like a, say, a specialized Epic, but for a fraction of the cost. So perhaps one we might review on Escape soon enough. Yeah. But, and uh, this specific bike, this new gravel bike as well, it's not expected to ship until February next year. So don't know the pricing for that, but definitely, yeah, we'll probably look at that when the time comes to get one in for review all right suvi well i think it's getting pretty late there for you it's it's almost 11 p.m so wait past we might, my bedtime uh, yes yes thank you for jumping on uh i'm gonna yeah try make this a, a regular thing with you so good to introduce you and i'll i'll bother you and uh with more questions in the future but uh until then we'll uh we'll say good night good night thank you all right cheers suvi. catch ya bye So, Brad, uh, on my mind this week uh, is it comes off the back of uh, an article by uh, Escape's Kit Nicholson. Uh, and Kit wrote about kits uh, in an article about basically the Mount Rushmore of uh, cycling kits. So, like professional racing kits over the years. So, like the four greatest kits of all time. Uh, and it got... All Mario Cipollini. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. I mean, you're going to get us cancelled, Brad. Sorry. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I guess that that struck uh, a conversation. There was a conversation a week ago or maybe two weeks ago on uh, Escape's Discord, which is sort of like a place members can hang out and, and chat freely. Yeah, there was a discussion about the Mount Rushmore of crank sets and what are the four greatest crank sets in cycling history. It's a discussion that if we were to actually pick four, we would anger the internet greatly. And uh, I don't think we're everyone's ever going to dis uh, agree on them so i'd say you know head to the article that for this podcast on escape collective if you're listening and jump into the comments there and share what you think is maybe you know one two three or four of your favorite crank sets of all time and what you think are the best but uh but brad you you told me you've been thinking about this all day so uh tell me what's on your list well i didn't i don't know if i narrowed it down to four either if anything my list just continued to grow uh, -oh. uh but uh was a split nine thousand shimano crank set on your list brad no uh no, but I do have a Shimano crank on my list okay. um, that's a little more interesting than that and a seldom seen one that people may not even know about. So, um, Is it carbon? So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. it is. I, you, you know about it. Have you ever seen the one in real life? 7800 carbon? 7800 dash C. Yes, I've never FC seen one in person. 7800 no. dash C. Um, we had a couple of them come through too, if I'm not mistaken, come through uh, Fresh Bikes mm. was the name of the bike shop. I worked out with Greg, my current co-conspirator uh, again he was um 
the the service department uh, head at the time, and we had some pretty fancy stuff in that bike shop. So mm. the uh, the FC seventy eight hundred C for carbon is the only carbon crank that Shimano has ever sold publicly, and it despite being from the 7800 series, it was really more um, aesthetically matched to the 7900 series of Durace, which was the, f- the first sort of under the bar tape routed yep. uh, shift housing version of Durace 10 speed. And this was a carbon crank sold in, I think it was maybe only 170 in 172.5 or there's like very few lengths offered. And it was uh, yeah, a carbon, a carbon Shimano crank uh, with the Holotech 2 spindle, same technology that still is basically what they're using these days. Yeah. But if you have never seen that crank, mm. they were super rare and uh, it's a beautiful crank. It's, you know, it's a styled of the of the era. So it's a, it kind of a, I don't know if I love that era of styling of parts in general all that much. Honestly, like it's like 2010-ish or so, yeah. I would say maybe that is roughly the time period we're talking here. Mm-hmm. I don't know that it'll, it will go down as the most beautiful era necessarily, which takes me to my next crank. But functional. Which is... Yeah, very functional. Like that kind of like a a phase change of like equipment, I would say, occurred around that time, especially on the road bike side. I would, I would put the like for me, like I would consider the seventy eight hundred crank perhaps one of Shimano's finest, just because it was like, you know, introduced the external bottom bracket and, uh, yeah, it had like a nice silver finish that didn't scuff so easily, and it was just kind of a fully functional crank set. Like it was such a wonderfully well shifting functional solid crank set at a time where a lot of brands are like hyper focused on doing carbon and having failures and having you know heavier cranks that didn't shift as well um for me that kind of stands out but sorry go on with your list well uh i agree with you 7800 was actually better than 7900 performance wise uh unfortunately um but uh i think the most beautiful and this is applies to the entire group set, but the 7700, mm-hmm. which was a traditional, it was an Octolink spline, but it was a traditional looking crank set, kind of more of your classic mid nineties. Uh, of course, the 25th anniversary edition, which is like a very high polished version would be the most special of that, of that series of crank that would be on my list yep. as well. Um, and although it may not be as um, technologically interesting, it was not that like different from its previous generation Mm -hmm. in the way that 7800 was very different from it it's a just a classically beautiful piece of kit that uh still to this day i you know have a very soft spot for that that group set Mm. um and and the functionality of that group set was just you know unbeatable so uh that's one i think one that was on everybody's list at some point in their life is the sweet wings uh titanium crank set yeah, which if you've been in cycling st- long enough you know, at least yeah yeah and it's it currently exists as the ee wings crank set um which is like a king creek yep. owned um titanium patent now but ee cycle works kind of made it before they were owned by king creek i guess and um before that it was sweet wings sweet wings i'm not yeah getting, i mean getting the story wrong but they kind of in- it's a beautiful titanium yeah it's like a outboard crank with a larger spindle and kind of did that before that was normal yeah they're the first to do that i believe yeah yeah or one of the yeah first. i think so yeah uh and this yeah, is the, yeah. a decade before you know shimano went to external bearings and others followed suit uh i think yeah sweet wings you know came out at a time where uh people yeah the cnc boom was happening where lots of small brands are making uh cnc parts and yeah, it's certainly a, a lovely component that unfortunately had a, a short life given the business didn't, you know, had some manufacturing issues or partner issues with manufacturing, uh, quickly led to its demise. But uh, yeah, it got rebirthed, like, was it almost two decades later by Cane Creek? So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, that's that certainly would definitely, I, I think that would have to go into the books. Uh, what about anything from the uh, Italians? So yeah, I, I feel like we owe can't be a nod here. And in, I don't know that I love like the the more current campy cranks mm-hmm. all that much the ultra torque but maybe i would so yeah the ultra torque stuff it is a great system uh and the bottom bracket as well it's incredible i don't know that it like gives me a special feeling but i remember getting a special feeling when campy released its first carbon crank which was actually made by zip who manufactured the arms for them but it was kind of in their style an aesthetic. Um, this was like a 10 speed era campy record crank. Right. So this would be like late 90s ish. I happen to have the second era, which is like more of like a 
normal carbon construction. And the, the distinguishing aesthetic is that the zip manufactured one had like a carbon weave to it, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to like a unidirectional type carbon, which is the one that uh, I have on a bike at home. It's one of my sort of lifetime collection bikes, you know? Yeah. But uh, the one it's the one that I wanted was the one before, which is hard to find and uh, it's a zip manufactured one. So yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting that. campy crank that I that I like. Uh, and again, it's like the Dura's one I mentioned, seldom seen, it's a unicorn. Yeah, yeah I, I actually don't know about that crank. I mean, I, I sort of came yeah. up in the time of like record carbon square taper cranks, uh, sort of what mm -hmm. my cycling. That's what they were. That is what they were. Oh, they were. Yeah, okay. They were. They were square taper. Yeah. 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 But uh, but uh, but this was like the first one, and they were like interesting. There was the Gucci one, and then like the ones that came after that that you probably do yeah occasionally see mm -hmm. here and there. Um, those were the less rare version gotcha. that was not manufactured by Zip. But anyway, that's you know that's some extra extra geeky stuff. Yeah. Maybe my favorite crank to see in the whole wide world. Mm -hmm. uh, this was one for my mountain bike peeps. Um, Shimano. Uh, XTR 950 series, the eight speed forearm crank in that uh, timeless gunmetal yes. kind of matte, yeah. matte gray um, forearm, uh, kind of the first time you saw a forearm crank set. Was that Octolink or Square Taper? Uh, the first one, it was it was the first version, the generation of Octolink yep. Yep. from uh, right. the Shimano mountain bikes. Mm -hmm. It was eight speed stuff. And uh, it kind of was the first time that, you know, the rings and the arm were like all one system. And, yep. you know, it was like kind of Special Shimano tool. took their their crank sets to a uh, next level of sophistication, I would say compared to anybody else. And yep. others like race face at the time with the forged uh, turbine LP crank. I was like the other kind of like baller crank to have yep. among many, you know, but I get that kind of late nineties, eight speed, nine speed era. But the, some about that aesthetic and the finish um, texture and color of that 950 series XDR is like uh, I love that so much. So yeah. that's like my other one. Yeah, interesting. I would say. Yeah, I mean, there's there's obviously a lot of a lot of names we could include in this list, and yeah, yeah, oh my god, I'm gonna yeah, the list goes yeah, on. Yeah, obviously, like yeah, I'd I'd love for people to jump into the comments on on the article on the site and and share with us what you think uh, should be on such a list, uh, the impossible list. But yeah, I guess before we move on from this topic, do you have any thoughts on what would what you think makes a crank set iconic? Is it like uh, introduction of new technology is it is it a design aesthetic that is kind of timeless like what for you i guess what what uh yeah what makes these things iconic to you kind of sounds like it's almost like a rarity like the, the rarer the crank the more excited you are yeah i mean the xtr ones weren't that rare no um no you know they were they were ex expensive relative to everything but uh they were common ish mm -hmm. you know you'd see them s still seeing them around and um but I think it's when there's like a, maybe it's an exclusivity, whether it's because it's exotic materials or an exotic brand that happens to actually be good mm. too, and perhaps is ushering in a new set of either capability or technology or whatever the case is, you know, whether it's like the outboard bearing crank and BB combo, like you described for the 7800, which was a kind of a huge step forward, uh, a step they kind of stopped at actually, they're kind of still doing yeah. that. They haven't really yeah, changed. No, it's the same. <laughs> but yep. uh but why change? It's great. Um you know, there's it's almost a faultless. If, system. if anything they made that uh, crank worse in future generations because of you know, exactly, as we've seen with the yeah. recall, like that seven eight hundred crank yeah. was it's rock solid. Yeah. It was. And um but yeah, I mean I don't know. The the E E wings one and that was just like a beautiful piece of like handmade, just high end stuff you know mm. and it's like do you need that did it really help was it that big of an advantage versus something else not really but it's just exceptionally well made it obviously caught i mean i think the thing retailed for like 650 or 700 bucks before you even had chain rings yeah. for it yet it, back in the 90s you know mm -hmm. which is insane but you kind of never forget it and you never forget the first time you really handle one yeah. too i don't know it's like it kind of they create a feeling somehow yes. that like you can't just you just can't shake it yeah so yeah yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I've certainly had some memorable crank sets over the years that I, I can understand where you're coming from with that. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, some cranks that I wish uh, my hoarding uh, forced me to hold on to rather than let them go for effectively nothing. But uh, yes. hindsight's 2020. But uh, but yeah, I guess uh, this, this topic also has me laughing because the crank set is one of those things that like every single new group set release, 
uh, if you read the comments, is uh, pretty much every, like without fault, every single group set release brings argument over people thinking the new crank set's ugly, uh, and it's kind of like this this universal truth that every new crank set is ugly until you're used to it, and then it looks quite nice compared to the next generation that comes out after it. So yeah, I think it it takes time for these cranks to to become the iconic uh, symbols that they are because I, I I can guarantee you in that. Jurei 7800 crank came out. People thought it was hideous and an eyesore and, you know, not a classic design. I called all. it the Starship Enterprise. Yeah. Yep. That's what it looked like to me. Yep. Just one man's opinion. Yep. Yep. So anyway, uh, a fun topic. Jump online, join the comments. But uh, yeah, uh, I, I know for a fact we've missed out a few that deserve to be mentioned. So um, please, yeah, add them in. All right, Brad, I think it is time for Ask a Ranch. Uh, this time, we, we're back. You and I are going to answer some questions. Uh, thank you to Tristan. Tristan from Wheelworks in New Zealand last week, get, diving deep into wheel building theory. And I'm actually going to do a bonus episode with Tristan in the next few weeks on all things uh, textile spokes, specifically bird spokes. He's, he's become somewhat of an expert on it. He's been quite hyper-obsessed with the idea of building those wheels better and um there's quite a lot to it so yeah i'm gonna talk to him about some back-to-back testing he's done between steel spokes and how you build a wheel with them and why you might consider the technology because it, it sounds like he's getting an increasing amount of demand for them as i'm sure other wheel builders are so i'm curious to learn more about them so that's i'm selfishly doing a podcast about them uh so yeah keep an ear out for that but brad uh for now let's We've got three questions. Let's jump into them. Uh, the first one is from Brandon Conine out of uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, yeah, let's hear what he has to ask. Um, while I'm really familiar with road bikes and the technology associated with them, I am much less familiar with mountain bike technology and specifically with uh, suspension settings and just suspension in general. Um, I have a new Pivot Mach 4 SL that I absolutely love to ride, um, but I'm trying to, one, keep up with maintenance and two, uh, just kind of fine tune some settings. Um, when I go to the uh, Fox website, I get completely overwhelmed with all the different types of forks, suspensions, which one I have, um, how to set the appropriate um, amount of pressure, dampening, everything like that. Um, do you have any specific recommendations on where to go for further information that maybe dumbs it down a little bit uh, and can kind of give me general overviews as opposed to tech pages from companies that just provide huge amounts of information, figures, graphs that uh, are a little bit overwhelming for somebody just newly getting into the maintenance of these uh, types of machines? Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Keep up the good work and looking forward to hearing your answer. All right, Brad. Uh, yeah, I mean, it sounds like uh, Brandon's somewhat new to the mountain bike world. Uh, what advice do you have to getting into the suspension and, and getting a, a good baseline set up? Yeah, well, this is a really good question, and it's uh, definitely an area worth spending time uh, to, to figure it out. So good job um, taking the initiative to not just accept how your bike uh, was handed to you at the shop and just ride it mm -hmm. from there without really thinking, which I think is uh, some people's approach or doing kind of minimal fiddling or being a little bit afraid to touch these things, but it's good to familiarize yourself. Um, these forks and shocks these days often have quite a number of features. So Fox's website does have kind of a good um, baseline settings and um, Dave and I were discussing this and you can uh, actually enter the serial number uh, from your shock or fork on their website and it will pull up the relevant manuals for the products that you have. So if you're having trouble figuring out exactly which model or spec you have uh, on your fork or shock, uh, that's one one good and quick way to do it. And um, and Fox does provide for their suspension components and for your riding style, rider weight, et cetera, some good baseline settings, like how many clicks of rebound, how many clicks of compression damping. Um, and if you have more features than that, it can go more uh, in depth than that. So uh, I would say everything kind of starts around a sag setting and that's um, sort of the baseline setting that any suspension fork. Can you define sag? I can, me? yeah. So when you're, when you're seated, um, on your bike in a fairly neutral seated position, uh, you want kind of, if you have any lockouts or anything like that, everything fully open, fully active, compression open. Um, so there's nothing resisting the settling in of the suspension as you sit on the bike. 
you're stationary, you're, you're hopefully leaning against the wall, but not holding against the wall. Like if you can rest your shoulder or so against the wall or in a door frame, that's often the best because you're not like some of your weights not being sort of channeled elsewhere to support your own self as you try not to tip over on your bike. Basically settle in, your suspension components will have a rubber O-ring around uh, one of the fork legs and the shock stanchion as well usually uh, is equipped with one on a new bike. And uh, so you'll basically set those um, before you sit on the bike. It's oftentimes maybe better if you have a friend or if you can settle those rings kind of all the way up to the body of the shock uh, so that when you get off, you can extend the components fork and shock and see how much travel uh, basically compressed into your shock and fork while you were seated in a neutral position on your bike. And you're kind of shooting, depending on the riding style type of bike, 20 to 25% of sag um, relative to the full stroke uh, is basically the benchmark there. Many manufacturers will provide kind of target ranges of air pressure, but I find that Those are sometimes just wrong, sometimes depending on your setup, like if you have a more aggressive lower front end and a weight distribution more over your fork uh, or the opposite setup where you're more upright, sometimes those air pressure settings that are like on a sticker on your fork leg aren't really that accurate in my opinion. So I like to do it off true sag measurements where I'm setting 20% is kind of my starting point usually and take it from there. I have a good friend who works for a company called S4 Suspension. It's a Canadian suspension tuning and uh, servicing company for mountain bikes specifically. My buddy Addison Zawada, he's a mechanic and a riding extraordinaire as well. And he does this professionally. And he actually pointed me to a really a good resource that, um, it's, of course, it's based on a YouTube video. Um, but it's a video that Fox, uh, I'm sorry, that uh, it's a guy who works for Fox named, Cordy, uh, named Jordy Cortez who uh, is like their pro level suspension tuner for like their pro downhill teams that they sponsor at Fox. And so if you if you Google the YouTube channel Lost Co, as in company, but abbreviated CO period, uh, that's basically the gist of what they do is talk about mountain bike and suspension um, technology and tuning and setup stuff. And uh, they have a, a great episode with Jordi Cortez uh, of Fox, who's been a legend in the racing side of uh, Fox suspension for quite a number of years. And it's basically, um, his setup tips for Fox, uh, not just for Fox stuff, but it's pretty specific to Fox stuff because that's his wheelhouse. So, um, it, it's called 11 mountain bike suspension tips from Jordi Cortez and, uh, Addison himself recommended that that be kind of a bench line, uh, reference for anyone who's getting started setting up their own suspension components at home. So there are a lot of good you know, YouTube videos out there that uh, you may see that some of which might get into the weeds technically. And this one is a pretty digestible one that uh, makes it kind of straightforward and gets you at least in a pretty good starting point. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, SAG is is fundamental to setting a suspension. That's that's absolutely going to be the, the biggest thing to get right. Um, but after that, you've got all like the the little adjustment knobs, at least on higher end suspension. And uh, yeah, I mean, Brad, you you mentioned like compression, rebound, all these various things that some of our listeners might not be familiar with. Um, rebound is basically the the control of how quickly the suspension returns to its full travel, uh, how, how quickly it bounces back after it's been compressed. And then uh, compression basically controls the the valving for how, yeah, how, how the damper responds to impact. So how much uh, force is required to get the suspension moving through its travel or into its travel and yeah that's very very basic but uh but yeah i mean that's 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 sort of two key things to know and it's commonly advised and i'm sure geordie recommends this in that video i actually haven't seen the video but uh i know he often recommends this is a thing called bracketing where yeah so the idea is is that you you basically just go out and play and you you figure out what the knobs do based on feel so uh you add two clicks in one direction and you go and do like a, a one minute downhill and feel what it's done to the ride. Uh, was it better before or was it better with this adjustment? Uh, and then, yeah, you basically just keep going and, and uh, you know, go the opposite. Don't be afraid. Like go the opposite way. Find out what that does uh, with the adjustments. Um, you know, add more rebound, take it away. Uh, but yeah, just change one thing at a time. Do a quick loop of a, a, a familiar little short trail and, and see what it does to the bike. And keep track of the adjustments you made and yeah the the bracketing will basically hone you into a, a setup that feels good to you because there is a lot of personal preference in this and a lot of it does also depend on you know the trails you're riding your riding style your riding level uh, you know how quickly you're hitting into things uh, all sorts of things so um 
but yeah, I mean, the, these adjustments are external of the suspension for easy adjustment. And so, yeah, don't be afraid to, to adjust and play and feel what they do. Um, you know, give yourself a, a, a ride just to do this. Uh, and you'll, you'll probably end up with a nice suspension setup that feels good and makes you faster and makes you happier on the bike. So go forth. All right. Uh, we'll include a, a link to the, that video Brad mentioned because uh, Geordie's a bit of a legend in the scene. So certainly worth sharing. The next question comes from Jeremy out of uh, Belgium. Let's, uh, let's listen to what uh, Jeremy has to ask. I was wondering if you could share with us uh, your tips and advices to increase the lifespan of a, of a road tire. Uh, I've been quite frustrated to toss a front tire that is still in good shape, but the rear is almost square. And I was wondering if it was a good idea to maybe switch the front with the rear every 200 and 300 kilometers or so, or to just uh, switch the front uh, at the back when the back is shut and then buy a brand new one. But you have visually some discrepancies between an old tire and a fresh new tire. So yeah, looking for your advice is to get the most of my beloved uh, Conti GP5000. And uh, as always, thank you for your great content. Cheers. Any tips for extending the life out of uh, the one contact patch you have with the ground? Uh, I think I think Jeremy is on on to the right on the right track here. Uh, I do recommend and do myself uh, as well re- uh, rotate my tires. You know, your rear one wears out if you don't change. You know, if you don't rotate them probably like three to four times faster than a front tire does maybe more, you know, especially if it's like a high performance tire, he's riding GP 5,000. So, um, not exactly an endurance tire and, uh, they will wear, especially because you're, you know, most of your weight is over the rear wheel and all your power is being driven through the rear wheel, uh, and tire into the ground. And, um, of course it's also easier to skid. Uh, so sometimes that's the explanation, but, uh, in any case, if you don't let it, um, go too far where it develops a very flat, kind of top where the transition to the shoulders of the tire are is like a point uh, where you that, that actually is kind of too far and I would say it's probably not advisable to rotate it at that point to the front because you'll get some squirrely handling characteristics especially in cornering when you kind of come off the flat spot onto that little edge and it's kind of a very small yeah it's a, it's it's hard to describe but it's a it's kind of a squirrely squirmy feeling and um that's only good if you're maybe just stretching the life in your commuter bike. But if you're if you're taking it seriously, I wouldn't wait too long. You can rotate though and and extend the life a little bit if you're paying close attention. Let's say to the to the wear. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, like all tires, um, bicycle tires can harden with time. They can be exposed to UV or temperature, and it can actually affect the quality of the rubber. So at a certain point. Um, Tires are disposable and consumable, and sometimes you just got to bite the bullet and, you know, just and just replace it. So, um, you know, if it's like during the season and you're putting a lot of miles down and you have the wherewithal and everything to do your own tire rotation, I would say if you're going probably not more than really five or six hundred miles on a, on a rear one before you put it up front, um, just to keep that kind of contour from becoming a flattened sort of profile if you look at it like it would if you you know rode it on a trainer all winter time you don't want it to be that that worn out before you rotate so if you're gonna rotate do it regularly i'm yeah I, i'm intrigued by that i mean i i know people do rotate tires i've never actually bothered to do it um but i do rotate tires in a different way which is uh i basically let the rear tire get flat and then you know once it starts to puncture or once it throws significant wear uh i'll replace it and this is assuming you're running the same tire front to rear Uh, at that point i'll rotate the old front tire to the rear wheel and then put a fresh tire on the front wheel perhaps that's the lazier way to do it but that way you're it, it goes back to what brad said whereas the tire rubber degrades and you know starts to crack apart or hardens so you don't have as much grip so for me i always like to have like the freshest tire on the front uh and that way you're you're not doing the common thing, which is like a lot of people ride with like a fresh rear tire and that front tire is four to five tires old at that point. You know, it's many, many years old and doesn't have as much grip as it should have. Um, that method really avoids doing that. So, but yeah, either way, it depends, you know, how often you want to be moving your tires around. I think Brad's definitely got a point. If you're rotating tires before they get worn, then that's going to extend the the life out of the set or you just wear through the rear and 
do what I suggest, which is switch the front to the rear and start fresh on the front again. Anything to add, add to that one? No, I think that's good. Yeah, I um, he said maybe his his own idea of uh, switching front to rear at a two to three hundred kilometer interval. Mm. So yeah, and as long as he's following that protocol, I think it's a safe thing to do. Um, if that's if that's your interest, it certainly will wear them out kind of on a evenly, you know, uh, which is thrilling. Yeah. And then you can replace them both and have two freshies, and there you go. Okay. Just for me, yeah. different approaches. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. Choose your own path. Uh, lucky last uh, for the questions this week comes from uh, Peter Malaki uh, out of Northern Colorado in the US. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's got a, a question about geometry. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Could you please talk me through the geometry and ride slash handling impacts that running 32 millimeter slicks on a cyclocross slash gravel bike that's designed for 38 millimeter gravel tires? My particular example is considering using my new Crux as both my cyclocross race bike in the fall and my do-everything road bike in the summer. My idea would be to use something like a Conti 5000 tubeless in a 32 millimeter wide size. I know there's been some discussion of using 40 millimeter slicks to minimize the geometry changes, but in my area, it would seem like the 32 millimeter tire would be a better compromise for our road and smooth gravel. Thanks a lot for all the great content you guys put together on both the podcast and the website. I look forward to every episode and it makes my long bike rides that much more pleasant. All right, Peter. Uh, the question you're asking is quite interesting because that newer specialized crux has become... I know quite a few people that are almost running it exclusively as a road bike. It's like got a bit more endurance geometry than like the Athos, but it's a very lightweight bike. So I know of some people that have they've kind of turned it into like this wide tired, more more comfortable Athos uh, version for Specialized. So uh, you can absolutely run it as a road bike with a 32 mil tire. It's There's no issue in doing it. But I guess in terms of what to expect, uh, I ran some numbers. If you were to have a 54 centimeter frame, uh, the stock trail figure on that is 67 millimeters with a 700 by 42 millimeter gravel tire. If you were to go to a 32 mil road tire on that, uh, your trail figure will reduce to 63 millimeters. And basically what that means is your handling will quick, uh, will quicken. So it's a pretty decent jump, 67 to 63 millimeters. But yeah, fundamentally, the bike will become a little bit more twitchy in its ways. Uh, yeah, require less input at the handlebar to, to get it moving in a different direction or get it changing direction. So change in how quick it handles is what you can expect. And the smaller the tire you go, the more noticeable that uh, quickening of the handling will get. Uh, also, you have to consider the change in diameter. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the bottom bracket on that bike is relatively low, but not ridiculously low. So you'll be safe with 32 mil tires, but, uh, but yeah, you're probably looking at, uh, lowering of the bottom bracket by approximately a centimeter, uh, between, uh, say a 42 mil gravel tire and a 32 mil road tire. So, uh, yeah, the risk there is that you'll just have to be a bit more mindful when you're pedaling through corners, uh, because you're your risk of pedal strike against the ground will be higher. Other than that, not a lot of issue. I mean, yeah, the, the quicker handling you'll, I believe you'll quickly get used to. And the, the pedal strike thing is, yeah, only, only an issue if you're really trying to push it through, you know, if you're really pedaling when you shouldn't. But uh, uh, I completely support your suggestion to go for it, first of all. And I would say, yeah, like what you described, both the sort of quickened handling characteristics of slightly lower BB and risk of pedal strikes on a downside pedal through the corner wouldn't really be different than if you hopped on a, let's say a real road bike, a true road bike, um, you'd probably experience both a shorter trail measurement and a lower BB height with the risk similar to what you would experience by dropping the effective BB height and pedal clearance if you switched to these smaller tires. So um, while it would be somewhat different and surely noticeable, you know, the characteristics of your bike would change. It wouldn't change to a point that's beyond what you would experience on a traditional road bike really in any measurable way. And therefore, um, also like Dave said, the crux is the kind of one of my favorite do everything bikes right now. Anyway, it's so lightweight. It is basically a road bike with extra clearance in the first place. So I think that's a great application. And if you're spending time on pavement exclusively or basically exclusively, then, uh, it would be a 
much more you know efficient ride and uh, i think you'd be pleased with the effects of a 32 mil tire on there and yeah i see no i see no reason not to yeah so there are other considerations like if you've got one buy on that bike uh the smaller tire will change your effective gearing so it's possible that you might not then have enough gearing like the chainring might not be big enough at that point if you have downsized the tire uh and also speeds on road are just that much higher so you sort of need higher gearing to begin with those are considerations to to think about but for the most part yeah this this really isn't going to be an issue on on this bike as long as you're not going too extreme on that that tire choice like 32 mils a pretty safe bet but yeah also there's increasing amount of data and feedback that uh, you can go just as fast and be more comfortable uh, on slightly wider tires. So, yeah, maybe consider like a 35 mil slick because you've got the clearance for it and your ride will just be that much smoother and faster. Food for thought. But, uh, but yeah, I guess just, just to add one more thing, like this question comes off the back of probably some of the things we've said, which is like some of these gravel bikes are optimized around really wide tires and that putting a a, a road tire on them can make them handle pretty funky. This Crux kind of, you know, is is sort of a, cyclocross race bike meets gravel bike so it's kind of middle ground as far as intended tire width use yeah if you've got a gravel bike that was built and its geometry is optimized around say a 50 mil tire then at that point it probably is too extreme to then want to put a a 30 or 32 mil slick on it and expect it to handle well um so yeah it's just sort of horses for courses and each bike will be different in terms of uh, where its baseline is intended to be and what you can practically get away with uh, but yeah, for most gravel bikes on the market, this sort of uh, tire change is, is fully expected and uh, often encouraged. So Encouraged by us, at least. Yes. So yeah. that's all that really yeah. matters. <laughs> uh, oh, well. Yes, yes. All right. Uh, that, I guess that concludes the questions for this week. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, we're a few weeks behind in answering them, so... Please stay tuned. Please uh, be patient. But uh, you can ask them as long as you're a member of Escape Collective. You can head to escapecollective.com forward slash hello. Uh, introduce yourself. Say where you're from. And then ask the question. Try to keep it brief. But uh, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. All right, Brad. Before we wrap up, there's just a, a few quick little tech bits to cover. I guess the main thing with this is uh, these tech bits, if you're reading Escape Collective, you already know about them because we're now including them in our new daily news. So it seems like we've got tech on the site in the daily news almost daily at this point. Uh, so yeah, if you love to hear what's new, then head to Escape Collective, head to the daily news article that gets refreshed every day. Check it out. Uh, you don't need to be a member to read it, but uh, being a member will give you a warm, fuzzy feeling. Some of the things of this week. Have you seen Rolf Prima's new EOS AR wheel? I have. I have. This is a, a 16 spoke. That's not very many. It's only eight on each Where side. Where are all the spokes? I don't know. You know, I actually have a set of old Rolf Prima uh, rim brake wheels on oh. a bike, which have 16 spokes as well. Mm-hmm. This is a rim brake bike, though. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's pushing it. They do wind up a bit. You can feel it. Um, I think also it forces the rim to be slightly overbuilt to compensate for having fewer spokes. So you get a little bit of a heavier rim than you otherwise might, which kind of defeats the purpose because that's where you most want to have weight not be. But to add a disc brake to this structure, to this design, which applies an incredibly uh, high amount of torsional stress kind of to the wheel for under braking, which is usually supported by many spokes and often is like, when you know the transition from rim to disc occurred, both mountain and road, um, you saw an increase either in number of spokes or the sort of weave pattern uh, of the spokes. You know, would be sort of more braced and supportive with like a three cross pattern on the disc side, even if it was radial on the non disc side. Um, this is just a handful of spokes on each side, and um, you know the hub flanges are large which may help to share the load and um, support the structure of the wheel. But I have a feeling this is um, something you want to test out in real life first, because it seems like a curious uh, approach to a disc wheel set, yeah. let's say. I mean, it's it's certainly interesting to go so few spokes, yeah. 16 spokes, just front and rear, mm-hmm. uh, standard steel spokes. I mean, Rolf Prima, like they're, they're saying, you know, it's passed all their internal tests and durability tests and all that. And they're they're confident that they can 
they can make this a reality. And the reason they're doing it is, I mean, one, fewer spokes they're claiming leads to a improvement in ride quality. But the other thing they're saying is that um, fewer spokes is just simply more aerodynamic. You know, there's there's just less material circling through the air at that point. Can't argue with with that. But yeah, I mean, it, it'll be interesting to see how these these play out. I mean, it's a company that's been making low spoke count wheels for many 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 years uh but yeah it's certainly pushing the boundaries of what you'd expect possible in a disc brake wheel so i thought it was interesting but uh it's, it's very cool looking uh, very cool looking wheel it's very different yeah, looking. yeah 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 so um yeah i mean you look at you're like just like what what who who took some pliers who <laughs> took some cutters to that wheel yes that poor wheel yes uh anyway yeah definitely an interesting product yeah, cool but uh yeah one one i'm keen to see how it plays out in the market uh also, it's talking of wheels. Uh, Hunt have released a new gravel race wheel, the 40 Limitless Gravel. Uh, some big weight savings going on here. They've dropped as much as 220 grams from the previous version. Uh, it's wide, but not crazy wide. So it's certainly not in the space of like uh, the Zip Explore wheels that came out recently. Uh, Hunt have actually stayed within ETRTO. Uh, recommendations and standards here. So uh, the front wheel is 40 mil deep. 27 millimeters wide internal uh 36 millimeters wide external uh the rear is a millimeter deeper a millimeter narrower uh internally and externally so uh yeah i mean not crazy numbers but certainly starting to see that trend balloon out a little bit where you know gravel wheels were 23 to 25 mil internal width and we're we are seeing those numbers grow out a little bit at this moment uh, these are hookless and complete wheel set weights start from 1,328 grams for a wheel set with carbon spokes. Um, it's pretty light. I like too the um, the the bead of the rim is so broad and mm-hmm. uh, and flat, like a, it's a what is it, like four four and a half millimeter width yeah. of the yeah, bead. So it, bead. basically, it's like um, I mean, it's partially how they get the rim to be as wide as it is externally, but the plus side is, and the, the benefit of the way they've shaped that kind of top of the bead is sort of designed to be a broad, flatter surface that is a little bit less prone to pinch flatting should you happen to bottom out the rim uh, against the tire and a hard impact. And that's typically what causes a snake bite type uh, puncture common on gravel bikes with low pressures on rougher surfaces. So um, a little bit of extra uh, benefit there as well. So nice to see kind of a thoughtful gravel wheel. It looks like a good wheel. And they, they, I think a lot of those weight savings, Dave, that you mentioned 220 grams is comes in the form of uh, carbon spokes that they use. Uh, and yep. they have a, they yep. have some, and, and also a lighter rim and a lighter rim. Yes, exactly. And, uh, yep. there are some versions of the wheel set, which costs less and have a traditional stainless bladed steel spoke, um, yep. you know, with a slight weight penalty versus the carbon ones, but Saves money. Indeed. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So, Hunt, like, very value-oriented consumer direct wheel company. Uh, yeah. So, there are options. Yeah. As Brad said, you can get go full fancy with, like, ceramic speed bearings mm-hmm. and carbon spokes. Ooh. Or you can uh, get steel steel bearings with steel spokes. Uh, In the same rim. The options are, are there. But, uh, yeah. Hunt 40 Limitless Gravel, uh, if you want to learn more about those. Uh, finally on the list is just uh, City. Brad, did you know City was still making shoes? I did, but uh, you know that that might have been me. But, but that, that but was uncalled for. I apologize. I know what you mean, even though it was me. Yeah, uh, it used to be sort of the preeminent shoe brand there out there. You know, it period. Um, it was. It's. I, it was the benchmark. Yeah, I. I mean, I'm sure they're still good. Actually, I haven't personally tried a pair in mm-hmm. 15 years. Probably, I would say. But uh, yeah. Anyway. You and many others, yeah. but uh, so City have released a shoe for Leroyka, like the old uh, classic bike event. Uh, so yeah, the Tenacia, Tenacia, Tenacia. Uh, it's a lace shoe with a classic look, uh, and yeah, I don't know. I think it looks cool. I think if you're if you're into the the retro vibes and if you're looking to enter Leroyka, I mean, this genuinely looks like a cool shoe. Yeah, it does. So. Yeah, it's not not what I would have expected necessarily to see City. Uh, come out with um in the grand in yeah. the grand scheme of things but i actually do love this shoe and I actually like i actually yeah. like lace-up shoes too that's a bit of a controversy but uh i do like them i had, I had some giro empires i had some i think it was s works six the sub six lace-up one something like that 
you're not alone on that. I know uh, James Wong also yeah. loves a uh, loves the Sub Six shoe. Yeah, so. Sub Six was a great shoe. So anyway, CB has a shoe, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty cool. It's not what you. It's not the traditional aesthetic from CD, so uh, it might be worth hitting a little Google search on that one if you like. You I, I, I like that CD's latest release is actually like basically a 40-year-old shoe. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, I will move on from there before the, uh, yeah, the cult of City uh, complained to me. But uh, yeah, it's it's cool to see that brand still around. I mean, they're not, they're not as big as they once were, but uh, still making footwear and uh, seemingly still doing unique things. So it's cool to see. All right. I think let's uh, wrap up the episode there. Brad, thank you for joining me. Always a pleasure. As a reminder, uh, Geek Warning is a product of Escape Collective and Escape Collective is wholly funded by our members. So thank you to those that make all of our content possible. And uh, yeah, for those that aren't a member, just know we're increasing the amount of content that we have exclusive to our members. So that comes in uh, weekly bonus episodes, uh, performance process and for geek warning, uh, but also uh, a large amount of our content is now behind a paywall uh, just because it's the only revenue model we have. So without that paywall, we cease to exist. Uh, So yeah, if you like what we do and you want to engage with more of our content, then please become a member escapecollective.com forward slash member until next week happy riding happy wrenching brad same time next week i'll be here with bells on all right all right sounds noisy all right see you then see you dave